Welcome back to another episode of Adoption Unfiltered. I'm an adoptee, Sarah Easterly, and I'm joined by um, my usual co-hosts and co-authors, Kelsey Vanderleet Ranyard, a birth mom, and Lori Holden, an adoptive mom. And today, as you can see, we have a really special guest with us today. I'm really excited to have Linnell Long here with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Linnell. Linnell is a Vietnamese adoptee. She resides in Australia, in Sydney. Um, she is the founder of Intercountry Adoptee Voices, also known as ICAV, uh, which she started 25 years ago in 1998. Um, and in that time, ICAV has become an extensive worldwide network for the intercountry adoptee community. And um, as we were just talking about, one of the oldest platforms worldwide for intercountry adoptee led um, individuals um, to collaborate, to share, to offer encouragement. Um, so there's the community aspect and the um, awareness aspect, but so much more. I was just trying to, I was thinking about how to introduce you, Linnell, and I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, that could take a whole episode because there's you're so accomplished and you've done so much, but I was just kind of putting in buckets there's the community that you've built. There's the advocacy work you've done, um, which I, I I like just even highlights. I can't even uh, distill quickly, but so much advocacy, so much legislative work um, through with the Hague working group um, and then and skipping over a lot of stuff. But also recently the UN special report. Um, so, um, there's so, all of that, so much awareness, um, that you have done over the years with resources for professionals and educators and, um, and suicide awareness, it, the list goes on. So I just, um, I'm trying not to fangirl here. I'm just, you're, you're someone I admire so much and, um, you've just done such important work. So we're just really, really pleased to have you here. So thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. And I'm just as much of a fan of your platform, so don't worry. <laughs> it goes both ways. <laughs> I'm referring people all the time to Sarah Easterly. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I know, and, and vice versa. So um, with you being in this space for such a long time, I um, I know you've seen a lot, but I guess if we could just back up a little bit, just what brought you to this work in the in the first place um, and then maybe we can talk about how it's gone and how it's evolved and, and what, what, what you see, you know, kind of, that's kind of my idea for today is what you, what you see as progress and where we're still stuck. Um, but to start with what brought you to adoption work? It is work. It is hard work, but, um, no, what brought me to this space initially was literally my own journey. You know, when you grow up isolated, alone, I was the only adoptee in my family who had four biological children. They raised me in rural country, Victoria, on a dairy farm. Um, so life was really hard because I was the only person of colour and nobody in the 1970s really understood about adoption at all, let alone intercountry transracial adoption. So my family are white Australian um, and I'm the only person of colour in that family. So, yeah, it was literally that experience of isolation um, that, you know, in my early 20s I went seeking help because I realised from some other issues that, you um, you know, it would be good to find people like me who could understand. I did, I had connected originally to a post-adoption service here in Sydney. And when I went to their day, it was all full of domestic adoptees. Um, it's, so I attended that day, but at the end of it, I, I did say to the, the hosts that, you know, hey, there were some things that they didn't cover that affect intercountry transracial adoptees, such as our race, ethnicity, the difference between us and our families, which is such a huge thing. And, um, you know, that just wasn't covered. And so I was like, don't you have other people like me who were born in one country but adopted into these white Australian families? And they were like, you know, well, we get some every now and again, but not tons. And I basically said to them, look, here's my name and number. And if you ever get them, please share because I'm going to start a group for them because obviously there isn't any. Um, so let's create one. So that is how I literally started. Um, just out of my own need, really, to connect with others like me, I knew the power of group healing um, because I had done group healing for other things. Yeah. I love that um, because, yeah, it's just... Um, it if it's not there, build it and, yes. and create it. And clearly 
there was a huge need um, because there are so many inter-country <laughs> adoptees worldwide and um, so many who have found your work and found it life-saving. Um, so it's, I'm so glad you, you took it upon yourself to <laughs> create what, what you needed too. Um, yeah. that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I, I was just kind of recently reading as you celebrated the 25 years, your timeline of events, um, which is just amazing. Um, what you initially kind of were going for community and then you got, you got into advocacy um, and doing a lot of legislation, legislative work as well. Can you share about the evolution of that? Yeah, I certainly didn't intend to be involved at a political or um, legislative area because I didn't even understand that stuff. You know, literally at the beginning of my journey, I was just like, you know, where are all the people like me? So I was really naive. I had no idea. It's not like I had a grand plan when I started ICAV. I was literally just wanting to connect with people like me. From the very beginning, because of my um, my professional life, which was I was in IT in a professional organisation, IBM, and I knew the power of the internet. So I had my website up fairly early. And from the very earliest time of having that website up, I had people connecting who were intercountry adoptees from all over the world. That's why the history of ICAV has always been that we have always included all adoptees like me, whether they are adopted to any other country, they can join ICAV because the what I found over the years was that when we shared our stories, found our voices, started to speak and started to connect, that there was so much in common. There is so much in common regardless of our birth country, regardless of our adoptive countries. So over time, I grew and learned from the community, um, connecting to so many, helping them to connect, realising that there were very specific country of origin kind of issues but also that there are very uh, a huge set of issues to be dealt with in our adoptive countries to change the ways in which we were not getting a lot of supports. So over the years, I just learned so much from the community. There are a lot of people that I learned from um, who, who had been doing this work in their own country for some time as well. Um, and I started to understand how things kind of were happening. And then what happened in Australia was that I ended up being the only adoptee to advise and consult with a group of 17 that the Australian government had formed out of a result of a national inquiry kind of process that happened here on intercountry adoption. So being the only adoptee amongst the other 17 who were all adoptive parents, I then got a really cool crash course into the politics, the the layout, the structure. And this is where I started to start to come to understand what is the Hague Convention? What does it do? How does it, how is it structured? And how are countries facilitating adoption across borders? So that was a really great platform for me to really get my head around, okay, what is the structures that actually create and facilitate our adoptions? Um, and then over the years, I eventually got to the point where I thought, you know what, I'm ready now because of, I guess, once you've done all that individual work on yourself and you come to terms with your own story, you eventually get to a point where you either decide you want to just leave now and go and live your life or, like me, I really wanted to do something more because I could see this huge need for really getting our voices into these crucial places that I now understood as a global framework for how this mechanism works so that was why I set my goals um, on I need to get us to the Hague Convention. We need to have our voices in there influencing government and influencing the way in which this very process that controls our life is actually structured. And I knew that from um, doing that here in Australia. So Australia was a bit like my my hotbed of learning where I learned how do you engage with government? How do you build a positive relationship with government? How do you understand what they're doing and you can speak their language so that you can twist and turn that system to work for you and to do what you want it to do? And I was successful in doing that because, you know, we had had a pro-adoption lobby organisation win the, uh, you know, win to the point where they got the Australian Prime Minister to allocate, you know, it was $33.5 million to pre-adoption over a five-year time frame. And 
we when that happened, it really stirred me up because I thought, oh, this is so annoying that government continues to facilitate adoption, but yet doesn't take any care or responsibility for all the ones of us who are already here. How can you continue to throw money at something that you just create so many of us, but yet you don't look after us, you don't check up on us, you don't actually ensure that we're we're turning out okay, our, our health and well-being. So that's why I first started kind of going down that track of thinking, okay, I've got to change this here in Australia because we need this money to be accessible, not just for the prospective parents, but it needs to be fair to the whole community, it needs to be equitable and equal, and it needs to make sure that we're balancing that properly. Now, the Australian government was very responsive to that, and so they ended up reallocating. And now the service is probably definitely more skewed to us now in terms of the, it's even named um, an adoptee service um, rather than adoptive family service. Um, so it definitely worked. And I've always utilised the knowledge that I've gained about how do you how do you advocate to your own government? How do you represent yourselves? How do you um, get your voices heard and demand that they consult with you and, and allow that lived experience feedback to go back into the very practice and policy of how they continue the practices? Um, so that's why around the world when I talk with a lot of other adoptee leaders, I'm usually, you know, gleaning from what they're doing and what they're learning with their governments as well as sharing what I've learned from mine. Um, and and it's it's a network in ICAV where we try and help prevent reinventing the wheel, you know, make things smarter because we're all working unpaid. We're all doing it out of passion. Um, we're all doing it because of our own lived experience. And it's important that we, you know, we, we try and improve efficiencies in how we do things. So um, it's been an amazing journey and um, I did take a break between providing that peer support community to changing that to advocacy. I, I took a break for two years. That was a really good thing and this is why I say to a lot of adoptee leaders, it's really important to take a break and have time out for yourself, refresh, rejuvenate, come back, be more focused on where you want to go, what you want to do, how to achieve it. That's when I changed our name to Intercountry Adoptive Voices because I realised the power of the voice at that level in government. It's really important to be influential there. Um, so ICAV's been doing that now for the past, since 2015, um, eight years, um, in terms of focusing directly on advocacy at international platforms and levels um, of government to make sure that the very people who are designing, constructing, agreeing on this type of process and practice actually here from our lived experience to learn the lessons as a bare minimum, but also hopefully to change the practice because we are so outdated in our mode of plenary adoption, which severs all of our origins um, and that needs to change as a bare, bare minimum. So I'd love to see it completely abolished but I don't know if that's very practical with governments and I know how, you know, how they operate. Um, if you talk to government about abolishment, they just will turn away and not listen to you. If you talk to them about how can you make this better, they'll actually listen to you and invite you to the tables because what they want is solutions. Um, and if you can help them to understand what kind of solutions we can put forward, um, that's, that's what, when they'll engage with you. Yeah, you're so good. You're so good at that, at speaking the language and making the progress that 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 you can in the ways that you have to with the constraints of the system. Um, Kelsey, I'm looking at you a little bit because I know you do you're you're on a similar path. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say about that or follow up. No, I, I really appreciate just the sentiment of, of trying to learn the system and understanding the frameworks because that's so important. And I see um in the United States, a lot of confusion around it and um, around the systems and a lack of understanding. Um, but I try so hard to educate on what the systems look like because the United States um, in comparison to pretty much every other Western country is so decentralized. Um, and we have 50 different sets of state laws that govern um, plenary domestic private adoption in very different ways. Um, there is no federal law that governs private adoptions. And so it's very fragmented and very challenging um, to create 
a widespread policy. We rely a lot on um, uniform laws, uh, but those are more, you know, you have to take that bill language and enact it in your state, which is a challenge in itself. And so um, we're dealing with a lot of, of that. The, the decentralization of our government is, is that way on purpose. And so um, I think knowing that is valuable. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very overwhelming to learn our systems for our domestic. And I work in the domestic public policy. Um, so I don't do the inter-country, um, but there's, there's a lot that I know we can learn from um, the, you know, the recent in the past, you know, two decades, the, the regulation of inter-country adoption and the effects that that has had um, really plummeted the numbers of, of children incoming to the United States. Um, but I think, I think there's something, there's takeaways there for us to learn in domestic work as well. Linnell, um, hearing you talk, I would, I'm about kind of, you know, you'd love to see adoption completely abolished what other like what are your do you have a that is that the big vision ultimately or do you have other kind of uh goals for for where you'd like the future to go another 25 years from now yeah well, for sure i mean I, I i recognize that we'll always need to care for children um and i think it's important to have discussions on alternatives to adoption because often when you talk about abolishment people just think well you know, automatically they're like, well, what's going to happen to all the children? You know, and that's where I speak about the fact that, you know, we've got to put as much effort as we do in adoption into family preservation, first and foremost. And then if that isn't a possibility, you know, it's definitely got to be kinship care. We've got to be doing more to keep children with their families of origin that are extended, you know, and that just doesn't happen enough in inter-country adoption at all. In fact, it happens very minimally. Um, so, and I, I take your point, Kelsey, before about the fact that, you know, America's got so many states with so much legislation that's disparate. We have the same problem here in Australia as well. Um, and it's a big job to try and what we call harmonise those adoption laws from, from state to state. And I know that the work of many of you in the United States, especially people like Gregory Luce, who I connect into very closely, um, you know, the whole mission is to try and get that legislation harmonised across the states. So I encourage, you know, the, I think what's important is um, for domestic adoptees in the United States, the mothers, the fathers have lost, the, the adoptees, is to unite as much as possible to push for these legislative changes to push for the recognition that there needs to be like a historic investigation into past practices. America remains one of the few countries in the world that still has not done that piece of work to recognise that for decades already, you've had so many practices of adoption going on that have never actually been looked at to understand where are things not going well? Where are things more harmful for people? Where is it damaging? Um, and every system needs to be able to do that critical look at itself, um, especially in today's era of understanding human rights, child's rights. I know that in the US it's more complex because you're not a signatory of the United Nations Child's Rights Charter. So it makes it so much more complex, especially for the intercountry adoptees there. But you do have other um, declarations and, and rights-based documents that should be the basis that underpin a lot of the work to advocate for changes and, and to harmonise your laws across across the country. Um, but definitely, you know, from, from what I know of the work here in Australia and in other countries like Ireland, the UK, Scotland, um, Belgium, Netherlands, all of the work that's being done is usually because the, the adoptees and the mothers, particularly the mothers, because they're the ones that, you know, have had to give up the child and often the fathers don't even know they've got one. Um, it's, it's the core group of people impacted who have to, you know, work together to actually push the governments for that recognition, for the need to investigate. Even if you started off in the largest state that facilitated the most adoptions historically, and you get a template kind of working there of how should this investigation look, and then you start to roll that idea out across other states. Um, just something like that needs to happen, and it still hasn't happened in the US. But I'm hoping that in the next 25 years, we might see something like that. So I'm very hopeful that a lot of the work that we have done in the inter-country adoptee community 
um, around the world in terms of investigations and, and, and looking critically at what are the practices um, that that has a bit of a snowball effect into places like America. You are still the the world's number one importer of children for intercountry adoption. So you're still the top country for us intercountry wise. Um, so for me, I have a very big vested interest to try and work with a lot of your groups and organisations to push for this change and to get some momentum because it is in my interest with all the adoptees that are in ICAV, I have so many of them, a large majority who are American um, and they still have nowhere to go to to right the wrongs of the past and to even be seen, you know, the State Department in the United States is, is uh, <laughs> they're definitely not on the same page as many of the other central authorities that I work with. Um, and it's, it's a real shame that, you know, we don't have an adoptee lens in America. Uh, it's very much driven by the demand of adopters still. So that needs to, you know, that's a huge amount of work that needs to shift and change. Your book is a huge part of getting that truth out there and helping people to awaken out of that fog of the typical adoption narrative that so many have just gullibly believed in without really understanding how complex, you know, this is. So, um, yeah, so part of my goals for the next 20 years, um, I'm working myself on, you know, I guess leading in a, in a direction that I know our community needs, and that is the lack of legislation, the lack of lawyers, the lack of people to actually hold institutions accountable. Um, in Australia, you know, we have a whole system that allows us to hold institutions accountable, our royal commissions and things like that. So we've been asking for a number of years for our legal adoptions to be recognised and to be apologised for because that's happened already for the domestic adoptees. So we have that whole mindset already um, about, you know, institutions need to be accountable for their roles in participating in the breaches to our human rights. Um, you know, that's that's like a foreign concept to you guys in the United States. But I'm hoping that, you know, with the connection that happens just, you know, through osmosis, through our, through our amazing, you know, networks that, these concepts and, and ideas will rub off and, and somehow flow into the US because it's very much needed. Yeah. One thing I wanted to say, because you just totally triggered my memory of something that happened this year about the investigations. Um, one thing I worked on in the spring of 2023 um, was a trying to get a report um, from the Federal Trade Commission um, and it actually made it into the bill. And I and I need to check now if it's passed because I totally forgot until you mentioned investigations. But I wanted to read this. Um, I just was looking for it and I found it. So the bill language, uh, it orders, it's basically, it's through the budget committee and then the, the federal um, and in Congress. And then they would demand the Federal Trade Commission, which is a, a federal agency, to conduct an investigation. And so the language, and it's still in the bill, I don't, I need to figure out if it's gonna pass or not. And I, it, it should, um, well, we hope, but it says, um, the committee is concerned by the proliferation of unlicensed adoption intermediaries, increasingly engaging in fraudulent or deceptive practices concerning domestic private adoption. The committee is aware of the growing practice of entities operating on a for-profit basis and charging exorbitant fees um, finders fees, matching fees to hopeful adoptive parents in exchange for matching and or facilitating interstate adoption services. In many cases, these brokers engage in illegal or deceptive advertising practices, potentially in violation of consumer protection laws. Um, and it goes on to say that the FTC should provide a briefing no later than 180, 180 days after the enactment. Um, this is so not adoptee centered, right? Um, and, and our laws are not adoptee centered at all. So um, one of the things that we did with this was use the systems that are already intact to swing it in the way that is, you know, favorable to the people impacted. Um, while not, you know, it's, you know, the commerce is, is not the right way to look at adoption. That's the way that our government is going to listen. And so that's the route we took. We have a major problem with, with people that aren't even, that are operating outside of even state licensure, um, charging these huge fees 
And so that's one of the things that, that they need to be totally abolished um, because they don't even have oversight in any way. And the, the exploitation is just out of this world. And so that's one of the things, but I, I don't even think this has ever happened as far as getting an investigation um, federally, the government to look at something. And so if this passes, I think that's setting a really positive precedent, I, I think, into looking into adoption a little bit deeper in our country, so. Yeah, fantastic work. It's so hard to get those small changes and wins. Um, what what it made me think while you're talking about that is it's really interesting how a country like the United States is actually, you know, one of the biggest signatories of the, the Hague Convention. So you already have this amazing framework that's been agreed upon internationally that is a baseline and yet it's not mirrored and reflected in your domestic adoption policy. So it begs the question of why not? Um, you know, because the Hague Convention, despite its many flaws, and it's a toothless tiger and it's totally ineffective at curbing trafficking, but there are some really good parts of it that do work well, such as setting mandatory standards for educating prospective parents, such as um, accrediting and having a process that requires accreditation of all intermediaries or facilitators, um, having the transparency to look at what's involved in every single part of the adoption process, making sure that you know, it's it's um, not taking advantage of people and just charging whatever they want. I mean, the Hague, the beauty of us for the Hague Convention is it it gives us an advantage that you don't have domestically in your domestic adoption policy is that we've got an international framework, even though it's a toothless tiger and pretty ineffective on many levels, it's been very effective on many other levels. Uh, what it's done the most is make sure that, that countries have to be educated when they're participating and, and dealing with adoption, it gives them a framework for this is the bare minimums of standards that you need to have. This is what the framework should look like. So I kind of want to just pose the thought out there that if you're looking for good um, a, a, yeah, model, model legislation is probably not the ideal that I'm looking for, but it's what it's called. But the Hague, for example, we just developed, for example, a toolkit to prevent and curb illicit practices in intercountry adoption. There is no reason why you couldn't look at that same toolkit and try and apply it to your domestic adoption processes and legislation to ensure that these very issues, because it's so thorough, what we covered in that toolkit is the best of the world's knowledge on illicit and illegal adoption practices. That these illegal and illicit adoption practices happen in each country, regardless of it being America or anywhere else, but it's the best of your knowledge from around the world and it can be applied and used to use it as, you know, hey, America, try and use the similar kind of template or process instead of reinventing the wheel, but it's already been created and done. Why aren't they using it? So. It's, it's interesting to me how the domestic, because our adoptions technically are domestic adoptions as well. Like, like we, when we, we, get, we get relinquished from our birth country, we get delivered to our adoptive country, we are then adopted under your domestic adoption laws. So we have a very much a vested interest in your domestic laws because it's our adoption, it's what we've been um, adopted under. So... Um, from that perspective, that makes sense that what's been written from intercountry perspective can still apply for the domestic situation as well. And there is no doubt, and this is what this is why a lot of people don't like the Hague Convention as adoptive parents or prospective parents, is that there is no doubt in my mind that the Hague Convention has clearly resulted in a in a in a drop off, in a massive curb of children being sent from one country to another. A, because countries who are signing up are actually forced to be educated on what they're participating in, to not be naive and gullible and just be blindly doing stuff, but to be learning from the best of the knowledge of seven decades of this practice. So if only we could overlay that and apply it domestically, then then we'd be in a much better position. Instead of you having to reinvent the wheel and take the next 50 years to get there, you can just shortcut it all, grab the framework that has been created, and I'm not, I'm not agreeing at all that it is wonderful and the answer to everything, but there are parts of it that you can definitely utilise to address the core issues that you face domestically, such as the lack of accreditation, 
Um, you know, that model works well for particularly in America. You had thousands and thousands of privatized um, adoption agencies before the Hague Convention came into, into effect in America. Today, that is reduced to a mere, you know, hundreds now, not thousands anymore. And it is much more highly regulated and it's definitely producing far better results than what you had before when everybody was doing, you know, a cowboy show of whatever works and whatever, whoever wants what. No, that's really great. I'm glad for that. I'm going to look through that for sure. I'm glad to hear you talking about adoptive parents and their role in this, because uh, I'm just thinking back to a coffee I had just this morning with, a woman who had read our book after adopting a couple of young adults, um, now young adults from Guatemala. Um, and then the story that we tell in our book about a woman who adopted her daughter from um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And at that point in our journey as adoptive parents, we don't know what we don't know. So we're going in trusting the process we're trusting that our governments and our agencies will have done all of the the due diligence work to make sure that what we're getting into is not child trafficking and for these for these people who i've talked to who do find out that it's child trafficking trafficking or it might be it's like we you know it's so easy to to figure out that adoptees lose something and the birth family loses something, but adoptive parents lose something too if they're willing to look at it that way. Um, that it's awful if you find out that you participated in something so, um, so just so terrible. You 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 would not do that going in. Most people would not do that going in, and then there's no way out once it's already happened. Well, there is an out because that's where a lot of the adoption laws are still legislated to allow you to undo an adoption, but not for the adoptee to undo the adoption. So, you know, in some states, but in, in reflection of what you've just talked about, I um, just did a podcast actually with a group in Canada, but I'd like to say the same thing that prospective parents, the onus is on them to do their homework and not to blindly believe governments or agencies, because we know from decades of this practice, that they are, they are the very ones who are actually facilitating the breach of our hu very human rights. Um, by facilitating any plenary adoption, every prospective parent needs to understand that they are obliterating their rights for their child to their original kin, not just their parents who might be struggling or might have said, yes, I'm happy to relinquish, but they're actually obliterating their rights to their whole extended family. Why should we lose so much to be helped when actually that's not the intention. We are not, we shouldn't have to lose so much in order to be given a home and a family to love us because our, you know, immediate parents are in a crisis at the time. This has such long lasting impacts that people fail to educate themselves about before they walk into an adoption. So I always try and make it very clear on, on things that I do that it is the onus is on the parents to actually do their homework to research widely because there is so much knowledge out there now, not back in the 70s. I'll, I'll give those parents, you know, um, some space to go, you know, yeah, they didn't know any better. You don't have that luxury and that excuse today. There is so much knowledge in proliferation about the illegal adoptions, about the illicit practices. All of these agencies and governments are responsible for this, but yet they're refusing to take responsibility and it is only as adoptees, like in my network, are starting to take legal action against their adoptive parents, against their states for facilitating these human rights breaches, that suddenly the world is going, oh, shit, what have I done, right? There is so much that out there. I publish this stuff daily. If you watch my news feeds, if you watch my spaces, I am publishing literally three to five articles a day about all of this and the trade of children and how it is commodification of children, stealing, co um, coercion, mostly coercion, and taking advantage of vulnerable people. We wouldn't do it in our first world countries, but we think that it's okay to do it in a third world or a second world country. Um, and that's just wrong. That's unethical. But the problem is, is that a lot of prospective parents are blind gullible and they're not doing the homework to go and educate themselves. So I hope they all read your book because your book's one of the few modern resources in the world that exists that actually concisely 
for such a huge complex topic, warns people of the dangers of the lifelong traumas of the enduring legacies of what adoption does to every single past person who has a role in that adoption, whether they be a birth parent, an adoptive parent, an adoptee. It makes it very clear, your book. And I totally loved your book because it does it so well and you've gotten such a wide array of voices in there with the truth of what this is really about. Um, and so many people are just blind to that. They don't educate themselves, but the very bare minimum, they need to read your book. But second to that, they need to find platforms like mine that actually talk very openly about what is an illegal and illicit adoption. What are these practices? What should you be looking for when you are participating in trying to adopt a child? Because if you don't know what that looks like up front, well, then you're bloody naive and stupid and you're asking for trouble. And, um, yeah, people will take advantage of your naivety. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the 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 kind words about the book, too. Um, if I could switch gears just a little bit, Linnell, um, you got a response from the Lutheran Church recent, relatively recently. Can you share a, a bit about that? How did that come, come about? Yeah, just to let people understand what that is. Um, I was sexually abused in my adoption. Um, so it's taken me, I, I reported it finally when I was about 43 to the police and my case actually only just finished this year with, with my father. Um, he pled guilty and he's He's on the sex offender registry. But um, in Australia, as I mentioned earlier, we have these incredible processes that allow us to hold institutions uh, accountable for the wrongs of the past. Australia did uh, a, a huge investigation on the sexual abuse of children that has occurred under institutional care. Now, technically, as an adoptee, I wouldn't normally be allowed to apply because if you're adopted, you're actually considered by law to be a private family matter issue. And adoption is a great way for governments to wipe their hands clean of children and their responsibility of children, and that's why they all love it so much. So what you see in Australia is that we did an investigation. Institutions were held accountable because my adopters actually failed to adopt me for 16 years while they had me, the abuse that went on during that time actually meant that I was technically legally under, under the government's care. I was actually under the guardianship of the Minister of Immigration. So that is why I was allowed to apply, even though by law I ended up eventually becoming adopted. Um, but I'm one of the rare few of the adoptees in Australia who's actually been able to apply um, for compensation, acknowledgement, and part of the process that we have here under the Royal Commission allows us to have a direct personal response from the institution involved. Um, and this allows us to have a choice as to we, whether we want to be given an apology to our face. I chose to do that. The Lutheran, um, the Lutheran Church uh, was the adoption agency who facilitated my parents and approved them, it appears, um, although all of the documents are all missing. Um, so because of that, that yeah, I, I, I requested to have the highest up authority in the Lutheran Church, who happened to be the Bishop, Bishop of Australia and New Zealand, and I met with him face to face. And it was incredibly just powerful healing experience to actually be apologised to, to my face. For me to be able to speak about the pain that it's caused, about the impacts, about how it's, you know, affected my whole life um, was incredibly um, huge and, and very healing because... Um, the facilitator, you end up having a, a mediator who facilitates it, so they're impartial to both sides. Um, just and what it what it gave me actually was a great model for how we actually should be dealing with a lot of the wrongs from the past. There should be a process where we don't have to go to a court of law to to be, you know, the the criminal process is horrendous for real truth. It's only great for the perpetrator because they just have to prove that you know they that you can't prove that they're guilty and they kind of get off so the whole system in the criminal justice system is really not great for the victim um, whereas a royal commission process like I went through is very much the onus is not on me to prove 
through the law that they did wrong. It's just was there enough to indicate that, yes, it probably happened. Um, so it's a different level of, I guess, accountability, um, and it means that the onus is not so much on the victim to have to do all the hard work to prove in a court of law that you were indeed a victim. Um, so much kinder to victims. And, yeah, it was very um, – I actually have the other one coming up this coming year uh, with the immigration minister I've asked for. Um, and that will be really powerful um, because, again, the message I will be talking about is the fact that adoptions are done like mine to this day still, and you you, you still have that domestically happening where too, where adoption is privatised. You have parents going off, paying a lawyer who will just do it because they're getting paid. They don't care about the child. They don't care about adoption. They don't care about any human rights. They're just getting money. So any lawyer will just go and, you know, get you a child if you pay enough money to them. Um, and this is how my adoption was done. Um, so, yeah, it's really important that we help immigration uh, understand because these are government departments who facilitate in and allow people who possibly go to another country, get themselves a child, come back in. There's not much scrutiny because they're bypassing effectively all the Hague Convention requirements to do a proper adoption. Therefore, this is why the message needs to be understood by all prospective parents that if you are facilitating a private adoption outside of the Hague Convention, you have no guarantee that your adoption is actually legal. It'll be like mine. It'll be highly illegal. Your child will come in if immigration allows you. And the onus is on the immigration department and minister to actually be accountable for was this child sourced through ethical and legal and proper means? That's why in the media you get some of these stories where parents are jumping up and down going, the American government's not allowing us into the country and not allowing my child who I adopted in Haiti to come here. Well, it's because the American government's damn well doing their job, which is good at last. They're actually stopping and trying to prevent illegal adoptions because they're private and they're not following proper ethical um, pathways. So... My next meeting with the Minister of Immigration will be to directly highlight that every country around the world is still allowing these types of adoptions to occur under the radar um, because it's not reported on in most of your adoption statistics. The, the adoptions that happen through that pathway are private and they don't get recorded usually. So, yeah, they're very much still the huge high-risk adoptions where you still get a lot of illegal and illicit practices happening. So um, that's why I've asked for a meeting with the Minister of Immigration, because at least that way, at least I know I'm educating them um, on how they're responsible and how this can play out as a worst case scenario. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that whole journey. And I'm glad you've got the apology to your face. And yeah. Um, and I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting an apology from the I, very yeah. institution that causes yeah. you so much harm this is yeah. what this is what we need to aspire to and yeah. hold them accountable for because well, it's just happened all that. over the yeah. world yeah i mean and i my adoption was a adoption by a coercion too in the baby scoop era and i would love i've actually written a piece that i can't find a home for that i'm demanding it's called a call for apologies and i wanted i it's at this point, I just want an apology. <laughs> like, yes. you know, I, I recognize the past cannot be undone. Um, and the point I'm at in my journey, I don't need it undone. I just want recognition that it wasn't right. And yes. especially when you're dealing with faith-based organizations so often in adoption, they know right from wrong. That's the, that's, they're supposed to. And, and, to, and they know all about repentance and the importance of that. So why is that not happening more widespread? Um, very frustrating. And I'm just excited that you got that win because it was really necessary after a lot of suffering and, and hardship that you had to go through. So, and I'll just reflect on that too, to just, um, from my experience, once you get an apology, it's, it is all that we thought we wanted but I can say from having gone through the experience on a number of different levels one for my sexual abuse two for my illegal adoption is that once you get the apology it's like this huge validation um, but what happens for me is that it, it's still not enough what what should follow an apology is reparation and this is where our royal commission did that uh, it allowed us to be paid you're compensated for our suffering as well as 
a healing process where you can actually be heard and have that direct apology. So there's there's a number of steps that I believe need to happen when you've been a victim of so much that's wrong. Um, and an apology is the first step, but it's not in itself sufficient and enough for the whole healing process. And you might find for yourself that as you go through that, if you get that, but um, I guess I just wanted to give you that longitudinal perspective on what is it to, you know, what is that process to be given or to find some sense of justice for yourself and how does it look like and how can it pan out? Um, my father apologized a number of times for his abuse over the last 20 years, but it was to me always a hollow apology because when I actually directly asked for compensation of all the expenses I'd paid for in therapy, it was, oh, no, no, I don't believe in blood money. And I was just like, well, how sorry are you? You know, you're not even willing to even pay me for all my costs that I had to bear. Um, neither were they willing to take the family to, to heal as a unit to actually facilitate, you know, it, I think it's so important to be able to be heard. This is the pain that you've caused me. These are the impacts. I think it's also important for the other person to be in a place where they can acknowledge this is the harm they've caused um, and, and to go into detail of that. So as a victim, you actually can hear that they've done the work to understand the wrongs that they've done. It's so easy to just say, I'm sorry, but what are you really sorry for? Do you understand what you've done? That's what a victim usually wants to see when you're going through these kind of processes. You want to see that they understand the full complexity and impact of what they've caused. I'm thinking about uh, Brene Brown has a, a podcast episode on apologies that I listen to a lot because like mm. everybody needs to know how to apologize properly. It's not, you're, you're right. It's not just the, I'm sorry. And I also wonder, um, like I said, I'm still waiting for my apology, but I, um, I do wonder too, um, you know, nothing's going to change it either. You know, like it, it's a step, it's important. It heal, it's, it heals, but does it, it I, I don't know. I'm thinking of reunion, how I, I kind of fantasized and, and just had this idea that reunion would fix everything for me. If, if, but I'm still adopted once I'm in reunion, <laughs> you know, like it, it doesn't change anything. Uh, it still happened. Um, and, and it's, then it's complicated. So I don't know where I'm going with that other than I, I see, I, I appreciate your sentiment too. I mean, it, just the apology is not, is not it either. Yeah, and, and definitely you're right about the fact that, you know, I think too all too often people think that you can suddenly just heal from all this trauma and you're so right that, you know, reunion or an apology in, a, in and of itself doesn't fix us. But, it, but I think it's about whether we can be empowered to yeah. hold institutions and people accountable whether that is a structure that is there to allow you to do that, that facilitates you to do that, that is, I think, a whole nother layer of healing that we can do. It's about empowering ourselves, realizing we don't have to be a victim all our life, but we can take charge as an adult. We can, we can hold people accountable. We can make sure that, you know, we've been heard. Um, there's such a huge lot that, you know, we could talk about, about, the pain and the trauma and how, what does healing really look like? Do we ever stop healing? I don't think it ever stops. I think it's personally for me, it's just been like the whole layers of, of unwrapping of all these complex issues and, and areas that we constantly navigate and come to terms with. For me, the whole end goal really is about integrating all of myself coming to terms with all of those traumas, being able to deal with them in a way that's constructive for myself and coming to terms with all of that. That's, I think, when we find peace. Um, and I certainly know because I've never had reunion because my adoption was done so dodgy that it's, you know, it's like mission impossible. Um, but I certainly know for myself, I have peace without finding my birth family. You can find peace without finding your birth family. It's not necessary, but it's the process of searching for yourself that is necessary. Um, and, and many of the things I've done in my life, you know, building ICAV, creating a community, it has all been about empowering myself, empowering the community, helping by leading by example. 
as to what can you do with that pain and trauma? How do you turn it into something useful for yourself so that it's not a burden, but it actually becomes a joy? You know, I'd never change all of the pain and trauma I went through now because it has made me who I am and it's amazing what I've done with it. Um, and, and that is the beautiful part is that, you know, we can come out of this very whole, very healthy, um, and it is completely possible to have a full filling life. It's just that there's an awful lot of work you've got to do to, to get there. Oh my gosh, that was so beautifully said. I wanted to ask you how you've changed over the years and I feel like you kind of just answered it, but, um, I, I just would also add like a, that what I see you doing too is making it better for the future and, and making a difference and how meaningful that must be on top of everything else that you just mentioned. It is very meaningful. I um, sometimes every now and again, I think about, you know, withdrawing from the space and living my life and going off in the sunset. But as my husband always tells me, he's like, you, you could never do that. This is your life. And I'm like, oh, Dang it. Yeah, he's right. Because <laughs> I, I kind of came to the end of, you know, a, a big part of my advocacy that I've been doing, um, you know, reaching my goal of getting us to the United Nations and having our voices heard and getting the, you know, the joint statement and things like that. Like, that has achieved so much. And I did wonder at the end of it, you know, what do I do now? So I've, I, it took me two months after that United Nations um presentation in September this year to really figure out what I wanted to do next and I've actually figured out now what I want to do next and that is I've I've been saying for a few years now we need a, a center of expertise that's legal um, and I need that to be an international center of um, you know legal expertise because the one area now and and probably because I've seen the fight for 25 years of us trying to achieve some sort of justice um, as adoptees as as mothers of loss, um, families of loss. It, it is such a huge injustice, this whole system of adoption and needs to be held accountable for. And I believe the only way that will ever happen is when we actually start to take legal action en masse and individually needs to happen around the world and across every border. Um, until that happens, these institutions and governments will not see um, that this is a risky business. You know, you've got to understand how businesses operate. If it's costly, they won't do it. So we've got to make it costly for them. And that's why my next stage I've decided is I'm going to go back and study law. I'm going to utilize all the knowledge I have, layer over that a bit of legal jargon and knowledge. And then I think um, I'll be in a much better position to achieve what I want next, which is I've spent the last eight years looking for lawyers myself to take up my own case to help other adoptees around the world. And we are so short of lawyers who even understand this. Do you know how many people I refer to Gregory Luce every day? Hundreds. And it's just, we are at such a loss for having legal expertise. So my next focus for the next decade will actually be the legal aspects and creating and creating a network of legal expertise so that we can fight this right at the heart of where it is. It's lawyers who have structured this very process but it's lawyers who are going to have to undo it and, and correct it because it's it's where it all begins. Yeah. I'm the only non-lawyer on my team. I went to law school for a year and then had to leave um, because it was the pandemic. <laughs> so, um, but that's one of my great, like, I don't know if it's a regret, but it's, you know, it's a regret that I couldn't finish, but um, it's, you're so right about the, the, they have set up this special language that and they have their own little Rosetta Stone and no one else can can translate it. And so it's, you're so right. They, they have to be at least a, a significant part of that undoing, so. So yeah, so my call out is for all impacted people who are victims, go and study law if it's in your, in your you know, mindset and if you, you're kind of geared that way because you know, uh, some of the amazing people in my community around the world, Peter Muller, he's a he's a, a Korean adoptee, adopted to Denmark. Um, also, um, Mariella Colleen in, um, in Belgium, adopted trafficked from Guatemala. 
Like they are two of the key people that I really uphold and look up to. They have made significant impact in the intercountry adoption space and they're both legal, um, legal experts. And we need more adoptees and mothers of loss who are legal experts who can work together to help our community in the ways that are most effective. We have to change the laws. We have to change the legislation. Why is it that every country around the world would not get rid of adoption, even though they understand and acknowledge that it's an outdated legal, like prehistoric dinosaur? Why are we still doing adoptions in the way we're doing it? Like, why have we not come up with a new model that's better, um, that learns from the lessons? Um, you know, and it's because it's in the two hard buckets. So I think what we need is we need people who understand law to put forward a different and better model of how children in need can be looked after without the human rights abuses, without, you know, all the, the problems that we've got now that are just replicating every day, every time someone's adopted. But yeah, so that's that's my focus for the next 20 years, and I'm hoping that it will make a significant dent um, in the huge work we've already done. And I and you know, and I want to acknowledge here that you know this is not my work alone. I work with thousands of adoptees around the world who are all like me, doing this work with passion. Um, through our sheer individual experience, it propels us because we are so upset about the the human rights abuses, about the 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 violence that occurs to us that people don't understand. Um, people think adoption is a wonderful thing, but if they really unpacked it, they'd realise it's it's an abuse of your rights, it's abuse of your origins, it's a, it's a lack of, it's it's traumatising you additionally, um, and it shouldn't be that way. We should be able looking after children who need care in ways that uh, are more beneficial to them and not actually doing more harm. So that's what I aim towards. Well, I appreciate your passion, Linnell, and I really hope a lot of people, a lot of people will heed that and, and feel the call to rally and, and study. And it, we've seen it happen with therapy, with therapists, when, you know, a lot of us growing up with therapists who were not adoptees or, you know, and, and saying some really hurtful things and not helping at all hurting and making things worse. And now there's seems like more and more adoptees becoming therapists and it's so fantastic. And so, and we do have a few, a handful of adoptee lawyers and birth parent lawyers. So we, hopefully this, this is, um, this is, this is really propelling. And I think that's fantastic. I can't wait to see what you do, um, and to just know you and, um, keep, you know, keep in contact. And, and I know one of the things we would like to do on our podcast is have a panel of people reimagining what that looks like. And so I'm already pre-inviting you back for that, uh, for that conversation when we get to that. Um, but yeah, we're just so grateful to have had you here today. Thank you so much for sharing. You just have so much wisdom and um, experience and just I know we just barely even scratched the surface. So I just appreciate what you were able to share with us in our hour or so, so meeting. And hopefully it's the first of many to come. No worries. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me.